Well, this morning, we are going to look at the goals of biblical counseling and the qualifications of a biblical counselor. And so this is a, it's a two-part lecture, really. In the first part, we're going to look at the goals of biblical counseling. When you're in the counseling room, um, you're not just listening, you're not just talking, you're not just having an aimless conversation. When you're counseling, you should have specific goals in mind. You should have specific objectives that you're trying to accomplish. You should have targets that you're aiming for. So biblical counseling should be focused. There should always be a goal in mind. In the second part of this lecture, we're going to look at the qualification of a, uh, qualifications of a biblical counselor. What qualifies you to be a biblical counselor? There are certain qualifications that you ought to have if you would, if you would be a biblical counselor. So let's just first begin by looking at the goals of biblical counseling. Is everyone ready? Ready for it this morning? Had your coffee? I see the pens are out. Everyone's ready to go. All right, good. So what are the goals of biblical counseling? I've listed six goals. This list isn't exhaustive. There may be more, but I want to encourage you to consider these six goals. I want to encourage you to for sure have a goal in mind when you walk into the counseling room. Don't be aimless. Don't just chit-chat. Have a target that you're aiming for with your counseling. Have a direction. Know where you want to go. So what are the goals? First one, to present the gospel and by God's grace lead a person to Christ. The very first time a person comes to see you, you should gather enough data to find out to the best you can if the person that you're working with is a Christian or not. You can ask them point blank, are you a Christian? Are you saved? Sometimes that's a good idea, but there's times when that's not the best idea. A lot of people will just say, yes, I am a Christian, when in fact they, they really don't know what it is even to be a Christian. What I usually do, instead of asking point blank, is I ask them this question, not right away, it's not the first question. I, I get going into the counseling for a while, gather some data, and then I ask this question once they're kind of warmed up and we're talking good. If you were to die tonight and you were standing at the gates of heaven and the Lord asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? The answer they give will often tell me if they understand the gospel or not, and it will at least give me an idea if they know the Lord or not. If they say something like, I, I think the Lord will let me in because I've been a good person, which happens really a lot, then I know they don't really have a good grasp on the gospel. Maybe they're a Christian, maybe they're not, but they don't have a good grasp. They don't understand <clears throat> that we're saved by faith in Christ, not works. At least they can't recite that. I, I, I know for sure that they, they need to at least hear the gospel. But even if they say, the Lord will let me in because I believe in Jesus, and I put my faith in him to save me, I've received him as my Lord and Savior, even if they say that, I... I'm going to go through a gospel presentation anyway. And the reason is a person can know how to talk like a Christian and still not be born again. And so I pretty much go through a gospel presentation with every counselee that comes in. And if they're saved, uh, well, just hearing the gospel will help a person get their heart in the right place to receive counseling anyway. But realize many of the people that you are going to see do not know the true gospel. Many of them are not saved. And you'll need to have a good method of sharing the gospel. You'll need, need to be able to share it well so that they really understand it. And uh, I've mentioned this a lot this weekend, at least in the other class I have. I, I use and highly recommend Dr. Stuart Scott, Scott's presentation called Presenting the Gospel in Its Context. And it's in your, I think it's in your books. I think it is. Faithfully Sowing the Seeds According to the Scriptures. However you present the gospel, know that this really is step number one. If, if your counselor isn't saved, you really won't be able to get very far with them. They, they need to hear the gospel and receive it if you're going to get anywhere with them. They, you, that's the first goal, to present the gospel and by God's grace lead a person to Christ. Let's look at a second goal. The second goal is to help a person get to the place where they really want to live for the Lord. Let's say you're working with a Christian. The counselor is saved. They're coming to see you because there's a problem in their life and they need help. Many Christians, over time, get themselves in a condition of lukewarmness. They get themselves in a place where the Lord is no longer the priority in their life. 
they can't honestly say they're living for the Lord. And the truth is, many of the problems that people present with would be eliminated if the counselee was first and foremost living for the Lord. For instance, how many marriage problems would be eliminated? I use marriage problems a lot because that the majority of the people that come into the counseling room are coming from marriage problems, probably 90%. How many marriage problems would be eliminated if a husband or a wife were truly determined to live in ways that are pleasing to God? How, how many marriages, how many, how many problems would be gone if the husband or wife, from their heart, were purposefully living to honor and please Jesus Christ? A lot of the problems would have never occurred in the first place. Our goal, our, you, one goal you should have as a biblical counselor is to help a Christian get to that place where they truly and really, with passion, want to live for the Lord. If a Christian gets to that place where they want to, from their heart, deny the sinful flesh and truly follow Jesus, I'm convinced that half or more of their problems are already solved just by getting to that heart attitude, just by getting there. Half their problems are solved. And so I try to help a Christian get to that place. I want to see them get to that place where they, where they just, I can't even emphasize this enough. I'll probably say this a hundred times this weekend. Maybe I won't. That's exaggerating. But I, I really, one thing I really try to do is get my counselees to get to that place where they want to live for and follow Christ Jesus from their heart. That is, that is such a big goal. And this might sound different and this might seem a little strange, but one of the best ways that I know of to help a lukewarm Christian get to that place where they really want to follow Jesus is to talk about the doctrine of election. You, you do what works for you. That's one of the things that works for me. I, and I'd like to spend a full lecture on this maybe another time, but in a nutshell, here's what we go over. I, I'll just make this like a little quick thing for you. We're born with a sinful nature. Our hearts are naturally hostile towards God. This is not what I'm telling my counselees. Romans 8, 7 says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. And so I let them know we, we would never seek God on our own. Romans three eleven says, no one understands. No one seeks for God. I mean, the Bible comes right out and says it. No one seeks for God. And that means that if Jesus died on the cross and made the way for our salvation possible, if he did all that needed to be done for our salvation, and then he left one final step for us to do, to simply come to him of our own free will, not one person on this earth would be saved. And that might sound a little bit strange, but the Bible says in John six forty four, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. No one can even come to Christ on their own. God must first give them a new heart. No one can come to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit first causes them to be born again, and then they'll come to Christ. Left to ourselves, we would all be lost. Our sinful nature is too hostile towards God to ever come to him on our own. Romans 8, 7, again, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. But God, before the foundation of the world, chose and loved a particular people, and he gave these people to Jesus. In John 6, 37, it says, However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I'll never reject them. Of all the people whom were given to Jesus, Jesus said he will lose none of them, not one. John six thirty nine, And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all that he has given me, but that I should raise them up the last day. I'll go over these passages with my counselees and go into more depth with it. I'm just kind of going quickly here. And I'll raise the question after I go through these passages, why is it that you're saved? I'm talking the Christian couples right there in front of me. We'll go over these passages and I'll say, why is it that you're saved? Why is it that you have been given eternal life? Why is it that you will enter heaven one day? Why is it that you're a beloved child of God? And the answer we go over is this. Because God, for his own reasons, chose to love you and elect you to salvation and make you one of his children before the foundation of the world. He could have passed over you and left you to yourself. And had he done that, you would most surely be lost, but he didn't. 
He loved you, though you didn't love him. He chose you, even though you wouldn't have chosen him. And he saved you, or you would have never been saved. He did it all. God chose to love you, and Jesus died for you on the cross, and the Holy Spirit at the appointed time caused you to be born again, and now completely by God's grace, you are loved and saved, and it was completely a work of God. And we go over this much more thoroughly than I just did, but I have found that this knowledge, this realization, tends to make true Christians feel remorse for their sin and sorrow for their lukewarmness, and they tend to have a renewed desire to love and follow the Lord Jesus. If God, through his word, brings your counsel to that place where they really want to live for Jesus, you've solved half of their problems before you've even looked at their problems. It's really true. And there's something very humbling and something very heart-changing about realizing the truth of the doctrine of election. It's something we don't talk about much. But it's amazing what that does to humble your heart. And so a second goal of biblical counseling is to help a person get to the place where they really want to live for the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Let's look at a third goal of biblical counseling. Third goal is to lead a person to repentance over their sin. This is similar to the last goal in that you're using the scriptures to help a counselee get their heart in the right place. Repentance means a change of thoughts leading to a change in behavior. The repentant person becomes aware of their sin against God and they're grieved over it, they're sorrowful, they seek God's forgiveness and they, they pray for help to truly change. With genuine repentance, the real thing, there's a, there's a feeling of sorrow, there's a brokenness over sin, there's a contrite spirit. A person's not merely sorry because they got caught in some sin there. They're sorry that they've sinned against the Lord. In a biblical counseling, when a person is caught up in some kind of sin, one of the goals is just to lead a person to genuine repentance. Now, understand genuine repentance is a gift from the Lord. We can't manufacture it in our counselees. But listen to this verse closely. It tells us what we can do and what we must do. In 2 Timothy 2.25, it says, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. When someone is in some kind of sin, we are, as counselors, to gently instruct them in the truth, in the hope and the prayer that God will grant repentance. Many times a person will come into counseling, they're, they're caught up in some sin. And you show them gently from Scripture that what they're doing is wrong. It's sinful. And many times you'll see a change of heart in the person. You'll see a brokenness over their sin and a resolve to change. And when that happens, God's granted repentance. Let's go to the fourth goal in biblical counseling. Fourth goal is to help a person solve a problem in their life biblically. When we counsel people, we want to share the gospel. We want to see them come to a place where they want to live for Jesus. We want to see them repent over sin. And we want to help them solve problems in their life, biblically. So sometimes a husband and wife will come in and their marriage is a mess. Suppose they get saved and they get to that place where they want to really live for Jesus. They're broken over their sin. Their, their hearts are now in the right place, but they still need help to solve the problems in their marriage. Perhaps they've developed a role reversal. She's the one leading. She takes charge. He's the one following. He's abdicated his position of being the head. This couple, even though they've repented and their hearts are in the right place and they want to follow Jesus, they still will need the nuts and the bolts of how to change the wrong patterns in their marriage. They'll need biblical instruction, and that's what you do. They'll need practical homework. They'll need accountability. And so a good portion of biblical counseling will be helping people to solve problems in their life biblically. Let's go to a fifth goal. To help a person grow in their sanctification. As Christians, we don't remain static for very long. It seems that we're either going forward or going backwards. It's, it's really true. Charles Spurgeon talked about, I believe it was him, talked about that, that being a Christian is like climbing up a mountain. And, 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 and you stop and you start sliding down, or you keep pushing forward. And it seems that way, doesn't it? And so we, we're either growing in Christ-likeness or we're slipping into lukewarmness or even backsliding. It's just the nature of how we are. We're growing or we're shrinking. 
One of the goals of a biblical counselor is to help a counselee to be growing in sanctification, to be growing in Christ-likeness. When you're counseling, you're helping a person to be conformed to the Word of God. You're helping a person put off the old sinful man and put on the new creation. You're helping a person to grow in their obedience to Christ. You're helping a person to grow in their love for their neighbor. You're helping a person to grow in their patience and their kindness and their faithfulness. And so one of your goals is to help a person grow in their Christian walk, their Christian life, their maturity in Christ. You do this through instruction. You do this through practical homework, through prayer, through discipline, training, and righteousness. Let me give you one more goal, number six. That is to help people become faithful in spiritual disciplines. This is almost like the last goal, to help people grow in their sanctification. But when a person becomes faithful in the spiritual disciplines, they, they tend to grow. If they're not practicing the disciplines in merely a, in a ritualistic, legalistic way, and let me explain this. Some of the spiritual disciplines as a Christian, you, you're aware of them, you, you probably do them. Some of them are prayer, Bible reading, memorization of scripture, worship, meditation on God's word, purposeful service to others. The purpose of spiritual disciplines is to grow in godliness. If we want our counselees to be growing in Christ, to be growing in their Christian walk, they'll need to get into the actual habit of practicing the spiritual disciplines. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, but have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And so the Bible says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. In other words, be disciplined in the pursuit of godliness. Practice the spiritual disciplines. As biblical counselors, one of your goals is going to be to help your counselors get into the habit of prayer, church attendance, Bible reading, scripture memorization, and so on, so that they'll continue to grow in godliness even after the counseling sessions are done. Now, there's needed a word of caution here. A person can get into a habit of prayer or Bible reading in such of a way that it's not helpful. For instance, suppose a person decides that they're, they're going to they're read the Bible every morning before breakfast, and so they do it, and they love it, and they're learning a lot and applying it in their life, and they're growing in their faith and love for the Lord. They're growing in obedience and godliness. That's all good. But what happens if their heart is in the wrong place? What happens if they decide to read the Bible each morning before breakfast, but they really don't want to? They're really not wanting to do this. And pretty soon they open up the Word and they read the required amount they've decided to read. They shut the Bible, not even knowing what they just read, and they walk away resentfully thinking, I, I've done my duty. Is that likely to help a person grow in Christ? Not, not really. When a person practices any of the church disciplines, they ought to do it with a true desire to please God, a desire to grow in Him, and not just as a duty. And so biblical counselors need to help their counselees practice the spiritual disciplines, but with the right heart. Now, these are just some of the goals of biblical counseling. We could list more. The most important thing to understand is biblical counseling is Christ-centered. It's about leading people to faith in Jesus and then helping believers to really follow him. It's kind of putting it in a nutshell, isn't it? Leading people to Christ, helping people to follow him. The Bible's our guide. The Bible's our authority in all that we do. Now, I'm going to say one more thing about the spiritual disciplines, something that you're going to find if you start biblical biblically counseling, whether you do it formally or informally. This is an interesting thing, how God works on counselors, not just counselees. When you find yourself counseling people, and you start giving them homework, and they start reading the Bible, and they start getting excited, and they're learning things, and they're memorizing things, and they're excitedly reading the Bible every morning. And if you as a counselor, if you're slacking, God's going to convict you by your counselees. All of a sudden, you're going to realize, I'm counseling this person, and they're passing me up. They're outdoing me. I'm the one who needs some counsel here. And so counseling is good for you. It helps you to stay on track. It, it, it really helps you to stay on track. It's hard to counsel somebody and, and, and watch them do 
what you're telling them to do if you're not doing it yourself. And so just, uh, it's good for you. It's really good for you. Let's look at the second part of this lecture. What qualifies you to be a biblical counselor? What qualifies you? Do you have to go to seminary? Do you have to get a master's degree? Do you have to be in vocational ministry as a career? Not, not at all. Do you have to have years of professional training? No. What is it then that qualifies you to be a biblical counselor? Well, let's look at the qualifications. Number one, these are, these are most certainly, there is qualifications. Number one, you must be a Christian. You must yourself believe in and you must trust in Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. That's the first requirement. As a biblical counselor, you'll be telling people about Jesus. You'll be leading people to Christ. You'll be helping people to see that the very goal of life is to please the Lord. If you're going to be helping people to turn to Jesus, to live for Jesus, to obey the Lord, you need to be doing the same yourself. And furthermore, the counsel you give will be from the Bible. To even understand the Bible properly, you need to be a Christian. You need to have the Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. As a biblical counselor, you'll be praying for your counseling. You'll be relying on the wisdom and grace of God. You'll need to pray for your prayers to be received and answered by God. You need to first be reconciled to God. You need to be a Christian. This seems like such an obvious point, but... It's really important just to mention it. I suppose a non-Christian could take God's word and speak it to someone, and because it is God's word, and it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, I suppose an unbeliever could technically, with the word of God, lead someone to Christ, lead someone to repentance, or give some very wise counsel. But that would not be the norm, would it? That would be a fluke. It would be like an unbelieving pastor in a church preaching the word but not believing it or living it himself, yet because he uses the word, people in the church were being saved anyway. You know what? That does actually happen. It could happen. It probably has happened because the word is powerful in spite of who's speaking it. But in biblical counseling, that would not be the norm, nor would it be very effective. Really, the first requirement, and first requirement is that the counselor is a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. And I take it that each person here today is. That's the first requirement. There's a second requirement. You must have a a decent knowledge of the Bible. You'll be using the Bible for your counseling. Therefore, you need to know it. This doesn't mean you have to have a seminary education. But if you would be effective, you need to know the material that you're using. And as a biblical counselor, if you're faithful and diligent, you will more and more be learning the Bible. If there's some of you right now who think, well, I don't really know the Bible that good, well, you will. You will. You start reading it, you start counseling it, and you will. You'll discover things in it that you didn't know before. It will become very much alive to you. It will become, well, you'll see God working through his word in the lives of your counselees, and and, and you will more and more realize how amazing God's word really is in people's lives. Now, you might know the Bible as well as you would like to right now, but you, you might not know the Bible as well as you'd like to right now. But pursue counseling anyway and, and just realize as you go, you're going to learn more and more. Be okay with that. You don't have to know every single thing. But just be okay with it. Just start somewhere. And you'll learn it more and more. Study it. Learn it. You'll be effective. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, so Christian, I want to encourage you to study the Bible. Be a, be a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. Just be in the word. Be in the word. Number three. You should have a reasonably good understanding of systematic theology. And this qualification is similar to the last one, but it's a little bit different. Systematic theology is, how many of you have heard of that? Have you heard of the word systematic theology? Good, most of you have. Most of you have. Well, let me tell you what it is. Systematic theology is when you take all that the Bible has to say about one subject and just put it all together. So that you have a good biblical understanding of that particular subject. For instance, 
if you were to look up, let's say you, you, look, you wanted to study forgiveness. And so you look up every verse you can possibly find on forgiveness. And you put them all together. And you study that. If you did that, you would have a really good, rounded out, sound understanding of what the Bible teaches us about forgiveness. Whenever we do that, when we take one thing and we look at what the Bible says about that, what does the Bible say in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the Epistles? What does the Bible say about this one topic? When we do that and we look at over the whole thing and we get a, a good, rounded out, solid idea of whatever doctrine we're looking at, that's called systematic theology. And fortunately, we're really blessed that some very, very good theologians over the years have written systematic theology textbooks. And I would encourage you to get one. Get a good systematic theology textbook. Because the table of contents will show all these different things that will talk about God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and forgiveness and the atonement. It will talk about um, the doctrine of election, the doctrine of adoption, uh, it'll, it'll just all these different topics and you can just go to that chapter and read what does the Bible say about this topic in the Old Testament, in the New Testament all, you just read it and you understand okay now I, now I can grasp this Wayne Grudem I personally like his uh, I like his systematic theology um, I don't agree with everything that he says about the end times or the, or the Holy Spirit He's a little more charismatic than I am, but it's really put together well. It's easy to read. It's really easy to understand. That's a good systematic theology. Uh, another one is by John Frame. He has a really excellent systematic theology. If you like deep thinking, deep books, then I think probably the best systematic theology book out there for you is Louis Burkhoff. Louis Burkhoff. Excellent. Just excellent. But but you're going to have to probably, probably uh, slow down your reading speed a little bit when you're reading Lewis Burkhoff. He, he, gets, he gets pretty deep, but he's, it's really good. The point is, if you're going to be a biblical counselor, pick up a good textbook on systematic theology. we got some out there. Um, otherwise, just look online. Because you're going to be asked questions by your counselee, and you're just going to need to know your theology, at least to a decent degree. And, and if they ask you something and you say, well, I don't know, just tell them. Just, I mean, if you don't know, just tell them, I don't know, but I'll find out. And have a good systematic theology book with you. You don't have to be an expert right away, but you should become an expert over time. You really should, and you will. You will. Uh, you're you're going to need to be able to uh, correct wrong theology, wrong thinking, which messes up people's lives. You're going to be able to, under, you're just going to need to know, well, let, let, let me just, let me talk about this just for a minute. People are going to come in to you. They're going to have problems in their life. And after you've counseled for a while and start learning your theology well enough, you're going to pick up on it that a lot of the problem they're having is because of wrong thinking about God. It's going to be because of wrong theology. And so if you understand that, then you're going to be able to say, hey, you know, let's look at this. And you'll be able to Show them from the scripture the way to think about something and show them the way they are thinking isn't right and really help somebody. And so don't underestimate the importance of knowing good theology, good doctrine. You're going to need to know that. And don't be intimidated by that if you don't know it yet, because you will. You already know more than you think. You really do. And as you study it, you'll learn more and more and more. Interesting thing happens. Um, we... Oh, at least I personally have seen a lot of people coming in and they're th like, they'll have a theology about, um, say, spiritual warfare. I'm going off script a little bit here, so my poor daughter's got to try to keep up with these slides. And anyways, people will come in with some wrong doctrine about spiritual uh, warfare. And I'm telling you, people will come in with anxiety, with fear, they're frightened. Uh, they think God's abandoned them. They think their problems because of a, a demon of lust or a demon of pride. There's all these different things with spiritual warfare. And if you go to scripture and you start studying it, 
you're going to find out that, and I'm serious when I say this, probably three quarters of the books out there on spiritual warfare, you could just take them and just toss them in the garbage. And that's being nice. I'd probably, it's actually more than that. So much of the books on spiritual warfare are actually a mixture of Christian doctrine and pagan superstition. It's amazing. It's just amazing. And, but that messes people up. Or people come in and they lack the assurance of salvation. And you got to doctrinally go to Scripture and show them how to gain assurance and why you can have assurance. So you need to know your theology. And you will. You will. Don't be intimidated by that. You'll, you'll know it. Let's look at the fourth qualification. You should be able to communicate well. And this is important, maybe more so than you think. If you're not a good communicator, then work on it. Then work on it. In biblical counseling, you'll need to speak clearly and simply and very accurately to your counselees. There's a way in which we can communicate where we are abstract or unclear, where we're unorganized, when we're scattered in our words and in our thinking, where we are fuzzy, fuzzy. And this will not do in biblical counseling. If you're not a clear communicator, you must work on it. Just work on it. Work on become, decide and determine to become a clear communicator. You'll need to be able to speak concretely and accurately and precisely and specifically with exactness. Don't underestimate how important this is. Years ago, I went to a secular so-called Christian counselor. In my 20s, I went to a few counselors for various things in my life where I wasn't living right, and um, I'm not glad for how I was living back then before uh, the Lord saved me, but I'm, I'm happy for the experience of experiencing some counselors because now I can see the distinctions really clearly between biblical counseling and secular counseling, and also this in-between stuff called Christian counseling that's more psychology. Anyways, I went to a counselor like that, and I'm glad for how vague and how fuzzy and how unclear and how abstract he was speaking because he was giving me bad counsel. He was giving me bad counsel. And when I left, I fortunately didn't know what he was talking about. And it wasn't because he, he, he had some kind of a topic, but he was so abstract, he was so unclear, he was so imprecise, he was so... I'll give you a word that's probably not even a word, but then it'll help you to remember it. He was so unconcrete. I don't think that's a word, is it? But that's, that's what it was. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. Make sure that you are so precise and so clear that when your counselee walks out of the counseling room, he or she knows exactly what you talked about. Psalm 37, 30 says, the mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. And so the mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, clear, concrete, precise wisdom. Let's, well, let me say one more thing about this one before I go to the next point. Um, what time do we got to be done here, do you know? Okay, so we got 20 minutes. When you're speaking concretely to people, two things about that. And you'll hear about this, more probably from Randy Patton, you'll hear about this. And maybe you've already heard about it a little bit. Have, has anyone mentioned yet um, the difference between ministering the word and dispensing the word? Okay. To minister the word is to take, like, someone comes in, with they, they've got a problem, you want to work on that, and you take a verse and maybe one or two verses, typically one verse, that really speaks to that issue. And you'll spend that session and you'll exegete. You'll draw out from the text what is the meaning of this text? What is the author trying to say to the reader? What does this mean? And now that we know exactly what this means and exactly what the Bible is saying, how does this apply to your life, to your specific circumstance? That's ministering the word. You take a verse and you look at it deeply and you apply it deeply and specifically and concretely to the situation. That is ministering the word. 
Dispensing the word, on the other hand, is taking verse after verse after verse and kind of skipping them over lightly and not really looking deeply at any, any of them. And it's just like, here's, here's what the Bible says, here, 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 that kind of thing. It's just going over a whole lot, but everything is so shallow. You're way better off if a counselor comes in to see you to drive one point deeply than to go over a broad area in a shallow manner. So minister the word. Minister the word concretely, precisely, deeply. And one more thing about that. Use words that a five-year-old could understand. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, not in the least, not in the least. But don't, if you know some theology, don't try to, to impress your counselees because you're using big fancy words. If there's a word you could use that is simple and a word that you could use that is complicated and they both can convey the same mean, meaning, go with the simple word. You talk in such of a way that if, if a five-year-old was in there, they would be able to walk out and know what was going on. And again, that's not condescending. That's just being wise. It's just being wise. And by the way, no one is so smart, and I'm quoting this from someone and don't remember who it was, probably Martin Luther, because I really like to read him a lot. No one is so wise that they cannot be taught something by a five-year-old. Isn't that true? And so be concrete, be precise, be exact, and be simple. Let's go to the fifth qualification. You should be walking the walk, not perfectly, but you should be growing in Christ yourself. As a biblical counselor, there's something that you're going to do that is incredible. You're going to be showing people how to live according to the Bible. That's amazing when you think about that. You're going to be showing people how to live according to God's word. You're going to show people where there is a need for repentance and change in their life. And you're going to instruct them on how to correct what is wrong. And you're going to give people homework on how to put into practice living for the Lord practically. That's amazing. And in order to do this for the people, you need to be doing it yourself. You and I, we won't be perfect. None of us are without sin. But if you're going to be telling a person, if you're going to be telling a man how to love his wife, you need to be loving your wife. If you're going to be telling a wife how to revere her husband, then you need to be revering your husband. If, if, you, if you're going to tell a person they need to be praying, you're going to sound kind of hollow and insincere if you're not praying. If you're going to be telling someone to repent from some sin, you're, 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 you're going to not sound very convincing if you yourself are practicing that same sin. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't be struggling with sin. You will, because you're human. But just as you're telling your counselors that they need to be changing and growing and becoming more like Christ, you too need to be changing and growing and becoming more like Christ. You need to walk the walk if you're going to talk the talk. And it's amazing how many times when you go into that counseling room that you find out when you left that God was using that session to counsel you more than the counselee. Because we're just sinners helping other sinners, right? So be humble and walk the walk to the best you can with God's grace and God's help. Ephesians 4 1 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Let's, let's go to a sixth qualification. You should have a servant's heart. If you be a biblical counselor, you're going to have to have a servant's heart. You, you're going to have to genuinely want to help people. Being a good biblical counselor is it's hard work, if you, if you mean to do it well. You, you need to be able to listen to people well and teach well and know the scriptures and have a loving heart with a desire to help others all at once, all, all at once. If you do not have a heart to serve, then I would say don't become a biblical counselor. But I would also guess that anyone who's here today wouldn't be here if they didn't have a servant's heart. It's important. You're going to put in a lot of hours. You're going to hear the stress of people's problems. It won't always be pleasant. It won't always be e easy. Sometimes you're going to hear things that you wish you didn't even hear. 
But if you have a servant's heart, if you truly love to help people in need, if you love to share God's word, if you want to see God's work in people's lives in amazing ways, then biblical counseling is for you. It really is. Sometimes you're going to go and you're going to have a a person come in or a couple come in and you're going to work with them and you're going to work with them and you're going to be praying for them and you're going to be laboring in the word and you're going to be doing everything you can to help them. And it's, it's, it's not going to work. The, the marriage is still going to fail. The person is still going to have a, a struggle with whatever's going on. That's going to happen. But you were faithful. You were faithful, so it's still not a failure. And so many times you're going to Go in there and with a servant's heart and you're going to love that person and you're going to be faithful to God's word and you're going to instruct them and teach them and love on them and pray for them and you're going to see amazing things happen. And wow, what a blessing that is. And God does work in amazing ways in the counseling room, formally or informally. You've probably already seen it, but if you haven't, you will. You will. Sometimes... I've had, this is so neat. You'll, you'll be affirmed in God's word too. I've had times where I've had a, a couple sitting right in front of me where I wasn't getting anywhere. And I, I was working with them for several weeks and I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't getting anywhere. And I instructed something from the word of God and I ended up walking out of that counseling room thinking, wow, Lord, this just isn't going anywhere. I think this case is about to be done. We just aren't getting anywhere. And then they come back next week and they're like uh, newlyweds. It's like they're just, they're great. And they talk, they talk about, we haven't been this good for years. And things are just going, and I don't even know what happened. And, then, and I'll ask, well, what happened? What's different? And they'll say, they'll, they'll just say one of the passages that I, I read or the, a verse we looked at, something out of the Word of God. And I just thought, based on, their halo data and based on the, their reaction to things and based on how they were doing that, that I'm reading the word of God and it's, it's just hitting and bouncing off a hard heart. And God took that word of God that I didn't think was going to do anything for this couple and he took it because it's sharper than any two-edged sword and he just put it right into their soul and spirit and changed them. And so you see God working right in front of you in amazing, amazing ways. And so you have a servant's heart. You're going to be blessed by seeing God's work right in front of you. So I want to encourage you in that. It's a blessed thing to, to be able to be a biblical counselor. You're going to see amazing things. You really will. Let me give you just a little bit more, another qualification. You need to rely on God in prayer. You need to rely on God in prayer. As a biblical counselor... You need to be a person of prayer. You'll need God's wisdom. You'll need his guidance. You'll need his help. James 1.5, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And I take this verse really seriously because the Lord says right here, If you lack wisdom, ask me, and I'll give it generously. And so what I do when I open up a counseling session, each time I, I pray first, and I specifically ask God, would you give me wisdom? Lord, give us wisdom in this session. And I believe he does. I believe he does. And so pray for God to give you wisdom. Pray for God to change hearts and lives. Pray for God to work on you and cause you to grow more in Christ. And realize it is God is the one. God is the one who causes the changes. We are a tool in his hand, but he's the one who causes the changes. And so we need to go to him in prayer. If you'd be a biblical counselor, you need to rely on God in prayer. And often.